good afternoon, everyone. First, I should apologise. I'm afraid I've got a cold, so um, I may not be as noisy as usual, which may actually be an advantage. Um, but on the other hand, um, I may start coughing, so I do apologise if that happens. Um, I'm afraid I'm not an electrical engineer. I was only ever a mechanical engineer, um, and that was quite a long time ago. I did my first degree at Durham. Um, and went and worked for the electricity industry in the UK, in the generation side. Um, worked there for rather more years than I care to remember. Um, moving from directly engineering through project management to running businesses and so on. So I'm not going to try and put up any equations because I'm sure that everybody in this room um, has better knowledge of um, uh, the actual technical side of engineering than I do, so I'm not going to try that. Um, However, um, for the last few years I've been working for Practical Action, as Colin mentioned. Um, Practical Action is a charity based here in the UK that's been going for about 50 years. Um, we work around technology, I would say, rather than on technology itself, though we do do some technology development, and particularly we work with universities who are developing technology um, to ensure that what they're doing is informed by the real needs of people in the developing world um, so that they don't develop things that then when they can bring part them on the ground just are completely irrelevant. They may work perfectly well technically but they just don't work in the social context. So we work on that side of technology, technology adaptation, we work in research, um, we also provide technical assistance to governments um, and to the private sector, um, to other NGOs, um, we provide advice on strategy, um, and we actually deliver projects on the ground. But we only do that where we think that it's going to demonstrate something that can then be rolled out better at scale by other people. Because we don't believe that in the end NGOs are going to deliver solutions for the developing world. We only think that we can show how they might be delivered. Um, one of the areas we work in is energy. We also work in agriculture in disaster risk reduction, climate change, and in water and sanitation. But don't ask me about any of those. I know about energy. So if you ask me about agriculture, I will just look blank and refer you to one of my colleagues. Um, when you come to look at energy, um, the first thing that strikes you is that a substantial part of the world's population just lives without the energy that we take absolutely for granted to make our homes comfortable, to enable us to work, and to connect with the outside world. Just to give you an idea of the disparity, um, you can see that most of Africa lives with 50 kilowatt hours per head per year, whereas New York City uses over 2,000, on average, the people there. And just to remind those of you who've got used to living in this nice urban bubble in Edinburgh, um, you really need, en need energy for the home, for lighting, for communication, for doing all the things that um, you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and particularly, you may not notice it so much, but for cooking. Um, without electricity or gas for cooking, homes are polluted. And it's estimated that more people die every year from um, air pollution, indoor air pollution from cooking than from malaria. Um, and gathering fuel places a huge burden on women uh, and on children. And the demand for firewood causes depletion of forest resources. Uh, energy is... Ah, I'm not moving these on. Sorry. And energy is also critical for work and for enhancing economic well-being. And for community services. So you need energy for lighting and computers, for storing vaccines. It's one of the health benefits. Um, and for street lighting and water supplies. That's all just reminding you. 
Um, so there was a major advance um, made in raising the profile of energy access with the launch of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative in 2012. And one of the goals of that initiative is universal energy access by 2030. Sustainable Energy for All was launched by the UN, so it's a UN initiative. Is the World Bank in there also? The World Bank, almost all development agencies are linked in there to providing different, different elements of it. So the UN has headed it, um, the World Bank has provided the tracking framework and a lot of the evidence behind it, um, various people have played different parts. It's, I wasn't planning to go into that in great detail. But there's a whole um, process involved whereby countries commit to um, the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. They commit to developing what are called action agendas and investment prospectuses. That's a process that's still ongoing. <coughs> Quite a lot of countries have action agendas that set sort of targets for themselves for energy access. Um, the investment prospectuses are supposed to be bankable documents which can be taken to um, prospective investors to say, um, you know, this is what we plan to do in terms of energy access and we need this much capital in order to invest and this is how, you know, it'll, it'll work financially. Um, the action agendas have worked reasonably well. The investment prospectuses are struggling a bit because most of the people who are preparing them aren't used to producing what bankers call fungible documents. Um, and then it's proving very difficult to actually get that investment. So it's sort of halfway up the, the, um, the trajectory, but it, it's then stalling a little, frankly, at the moment. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of questioning as to how much further that will go. I think the gentleman here had a question. Yes, I just wanted to point out uh, the target of uh, the investment. There is not one single target, I'm afraid. I don't have a figure for that because I don't believe such a figure exists. The um, process by which the World Bank agrees its investment is on a country-by-country -country basis. A lot of money is being notionally put forward for energy access, um, partly in terms of grid access and partly in terms of off-grid solutions. Um, but I don't have a figure for, I'm sorry, I don't have a figure to my mind for the total lot. But, I mean, Power Africa are putting money forward with the Department for International Development, the African <coughs> Development Bank. So there is more money coming forward. But most of the people you speak to in those agencies are willing to put money forward, are struggling to find the pipeline into which to put them. It's a, it's a demand issue as well as a supply issue. Um, and um, there was a, a major step forward, as you're probably aware, about a year ago, when the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted, replacing the Millennium Development Goals and right at the heart of them is a commitment to ensure that everybody has access to clean, affordable energy by 2030. So essentially carrying on the SE for All goal. <coughs> nah. But despite progress in recognition of the energy access issue, and in setting global goals on energy access, current approaches um, to planning and provision remain inadequate to address these goals. It's clear that under any form of business for a usual scenario, they're going to be missed. Um, the Global Tracking 2015 report that was produced last year says that there have been notable gains in electrification, driven primarily by India. Previously, a lot of the progress was coming from China. This time it's moved to India. But progress in Africa remains far too slow. And in order to advance towards universal energy access, you have to be providing that access more quickly um, than demographic growth, than growth in population. But only eight of the countries, uh, sorry, eight of the 20 countries with the largest electrification deficits have actually exceeded demographic growth in terms of providing energy access. 
Um, and in sub-Saharan Africa, electrification has only just managed to remain abreast of economic growth, of demographic growth. And the position for cooking is even worse, um, with negligible progress um, and cooking continuing to fall behind population growth. So though more people are getting better energy access, the number of people without decent energy access is continuing to grow too. Um, and globally at the moment, forecasts are that about 1.2 billion will remain without electricity by the end of 2030, despite the goal of universal energy access by then, and about 540 million beyond 2040. So, you know, the targets we're setting you know, at the current trajectory are just not going to be achieved. So we're using the same approaches and thinking that has left people without access in the past. And unless there's a radical change, mil billions of people will continue to struggle to access the energy they need for their lives and livelihoods. Um, in particular, you know, what we're focusing on today, and I'm focusing on today, is that energy planners continue to focus overwhelmingly on grid expansion. And progress is seen in terms of numbers of connections and megawatt hours produced. Different levels of supply are often ignored. And a solar lantern or an unreliable grid connection um, and fully reliable access are all seen as meeting the requirement for energy access, which they clearly don't. Um, it's much simpler and easier for planning authorities and investors and banks to concentrate on large one-off investments like grid extensions than to engage with the multifaceted world of off-grid access. But while grid extension is often, genuinely, the least cost solution, depending a bit on how you value the capital, that fails to in take into account the time dimension. So planning, permitting, and constructing large-scale power stations and infrastructure takes years. And in the meantime, it's those without access who are suffering the opportunity cost on their lives. Above all, planners fail to consult with those in energy poverty, so their voices are not heard in comparison with, the, with those already connected to the grid and to industry, which is using large quantities of energy. <coughs> Sorry about this. In practice action, we've been trying to take a more people-centred approach to energy access. Um, and through um, a publication that we produce periodically called the Poor People's Energy Outlook, um, we've looked at energy access from a poor person's perspective. <coughs> and from, from, you know, our belief is that that's not about connections and megawatts but it's about energy services, what energy allows you to do. Um, and in the previous editions of the PPO, we set out a framework for what we've called total energy access, looking at energy not just in households, but also for productive uses and community services, um, for energy services rather than just supply, and for cooking and mechanical power as well as electricity. Um, there's an edition that's just coming out pretty much now. It's going to be launched next week. It's out on the web, um, and basically you're getting a, a bit of a preview because I'm here. Um, and it focuses on national energy planning and calls for a paradigm shift. So over the past... Uh, 12 months or so. Um, we've consulted 12 communities in three countries across East, West Africa and South Asia. Um, we've been doing surveys, in-depth interviews, 
um, and holding community workshops to work out their energy needs and their priorities and preferences in terms of energy. Um, we then use that data um, to estimate de demand for different types and forms of energy um, on the basis of what people themselves believe they need. And we've compared that with a centrally defined level of, of, of need for access um, and with what people have said they can afford to pay for access. Um, and we've calculated the capital of on and ongoing costs of provision to develop what we believe forms the optimum combination of energy access for their needs. Um, and then by comparing um, between communities, we've been able to draw some common conclusions um, and also some differences. Now, you'll see there I've got a sort of a, an iteration. Um, that's because um, the cost of a mini-grid and, and similar system-based approaches depends on how many people connect so you get an iteration where the more people connect, <coughs> the cost goes up, but it doesn't go up linearly, and, and, and so on. Um, and then you may find that um, if you've got too people, few people connecting, then actually it's unaffordable for the people who originally said they'd want to connect. So you end up going around in circles. Um, I would say the first, you know, the, the results we've got confirmed the scale of the challenge. Um, Eight in 12 of the communities we looked at, less than 30% of the people had any form of electricity, none whatsoever, um, beyond um, battery torches. Those who had electricity were at most at um, what is called Tier 1, the global tracking framework that's been developed by uh, the World Bank, recognises five tiers of access, the lowest one of which is um, basically lighting and phone charging, um, and, uh, 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 and what's called a non-manufactured stove. It's a, a, a stove which um, doesn't have any form of quality guarantee behind it. Tier 5 is the four sort of energy access you enjoy every day, day of your life, um, and um, uh, uh, cooking that, that is completely non-polluting. Um, whereas... 92% of the people we talked with wanted something between Tier 2 and Tier 3. Um, and most people continue to rely on biomass stoves. In Bangladesh, and I have to say this shocked me, less than 1% had a manufactured stove. And in Togo, less than 3% did. So the majority of people are still cooking on three stone fires. Um, largely with wood. If we looked at people's needs and priorities, um, the first thing people wanted was household energy for lighting, cooking and phone charging. And that was the top priority in 11 of the 12 communities that we spoke with. Um, the second priority in 10 of the 12 communities was energy for community service. Street lighting came out very high and schools um, and then probably behind that health centres. Um, energy for agriculture, especially for irrigation and grain milling, and for businesses came after that. And speaking to one of the um, gentlemen who spoke right at the beginning, one of the things that surprised us was that in two communities, charging for electric vehicles, which they didn't yet have, but people in the surrounding area had, and they really wanted, was a high priority. So... Uh, <coughs> Um, we were surprised by that one. Um, and most businesses, as I said, wanted to be, most households wanted something between Tier 2 and Tier 3 for businesses and productive uses and community facilities. Often, they often require Tier of 4 or 5. And there were some important gender differences. For women, household energy is particularly important. Cooking, comfort at home, security, and so on. We were quite surprised that Street lighting, which is often cast as a women's issue, men were more keen about. Possibly that's because in some of these communities, particularly in Bangladesh, um, women are more likely to remain in the home than men go out. I don't know. We didn't get some of the reasons behind some of these things, but it came across strongly in almost all the communities that they wanted street lighting. 
and women and men have different productive tasks um, and women particularly were interested in energy for um, pumping for water um, for irrigation of crops and for grain milling um, and men possibly for post-harvest storage of crops This is a, a slide with a lot on it. Um, this is specific to Kenya, but it's actually a lot of these messages were common across all the countries, so I haven't provided three different slides, one for each. Um, and first looking at different forms of energy, in five of the communities, mini grids were the cheapest option, while three would be served by best served by standalone options. In about half the communities we looked at, grid extension and large scale generation essentially did come out as the lowest cost option on an annualised basis, but that was obviously very reliant on what um, cost of capital you used. And in almost all the communities, mini grids and other off grid options compared, uh, com provided a comparative, comparable quicker option or uh, low capital cost. Generally the cost of a mini grid was about, the capital cost was about a third of the cost of grid connection, very broadly, obviously depending on the size of the community and the distance from the grid, um, but that was a, a rough rule of thumb. Um, and, um, but the, the operating cost was then often lower. Um, when it came to affordability, um, I think one um, thing that again, you know, is, is really noticeable, the where about 35 to 40% of the people in the communities who could not afford any form of modern energy access. So, you know, we, there are people who are paying more money in rural communities for traditional energy access than for modern. But there are also people who can't afford it. So, you know, is there a right, uh, a human rights issue? Is this something that people should have, um, that it should be made affordable for all? If we're going to get universal energy access, we will need some form of support, some forms of support. Um, on cooking, um, in some of the, um, the communities, um, women and children were spending very substantial amounts of time every week. Connect, collecting fuel um, and f cooking and fuel is an area that often gets less attention than electricity. I'm an electricity person so I'll hold myself guilty in this. I often talk about electricity when I should be talking about cooking as well. But often cooking is actually a quicker lower cost win than electricity um, but it doesn't get the attention. As we said already, energy for schools and for um, street lighting was seen as a very high priority. Um, and agriculture was an area where benefits were possible to be achieved. Um, the key message is that no single solution is best for everyone. In almost all the communities, a mix of solutions provided the most appropriate energy mix. And it's important to recognise that energy access is a community issue. Not only is it needed to support community facilities and activities which affect the whole community, um, but decisions on access taken by one individual can affect others. For instance, a smaller mini-grid may provide cheaper access um, for those who, who, who get that mini-grid, but it leaves people outside that mini-grid area with no option except to have a standalone solution that's much more expensive or to have no access, access at all. Um, so there are some payoffs there that may not be settled at the optimum position by just leaving this to the market um, and to the private sector. Um, the playing field between off-grid and on-grid solutions isn't even. Subsidy and cross-subsidy mean that the real cost of grid extension in Bangladesh is about six to nine times 
the amount being charged to the users in the communities to which the grid is extended. And in Kenya, it's between two and six times. And it's not that you know, I certainly would object to those subsidies, but those using off-grid solutions have to pay the full cost. So you end up with something that isn't a level playing field. <coughs> Finally, I'd just like to say that... Oh, no, I've gone too far. I'd just like to say that um, for us, this is you know, just part way along a journey. We've had the previous um, editions of the, the Poor People's Energy Outlook. This year, we're talking about where priorities should sit, poor people's priorities should sit in national energy planning. Next year, we're going to be looking at how we extrapolate those to the national picture um, and look at um, what needs to be done and what financing will be needed um, to support true universal energy access on a national scale. And then the year after, we'll be looking at how those forms of energy access can be delivered at scale. And uh, I'll just say that's, that's, that's it for me for today. Um, obviously happy to try and answer any questions or, you know, if you just want to discuss amongst yourselves, that's fine. With me. <laughs>